College Football Nerds here talking Alabama, Georgia recap. We don't do a lot of these, but when there's a game this big and it shakes up the landscape a little bit, we're going to talk about it. And this game was just that good. Like on all sides, there's stuff to be excited about if you're a Georgia fan, even in the loss, especially where you were at halftime versus where you ended up. Uh, I got Josh with you. We're going to get nerdy with y'all. We're going to talk some stats. We're going to talk some some numbers, but we're also just going to talk about game flow and how things went and what we observed. So let's get into it, Josh. The first thing I want to talk about is, you know, I picked Georgia in this game for one of the reasons I did. And I said, if I knew the answer to this question, I would probably pick Alabama if it was the way I thought. I didn't know if, you know, the early season competition that Alabama had that wasn't great allowed them to hold back a lot of their offense versus, you know, cause versus them just not being great offensively and being limited in some way in similar ways that we saw last year. Cause a lot of what we saw with this offense inefficient, relying on the deep shot. Um, we saw that the first few games, but I said, if they are holding the bag back, um, there's a lot of opportunity here, and I would probably pick Alabama. And that's just something you don't know until you go into the game. And a lot of fans, you'll hear them talk about, like, we haven't opened up a playbook yet, and they're usually wrong. In this case, I think we were right to think that this was a possibility, and I think it's actually what happened. I think that Alabama sat on their real offense because they had one opportunity to spring it on somebody, and that somebody was Georgia. What do you think? I definitely think there were a lot of things they they kind of held back offensively. Now, some of that stuff probably had a little bit to do to not being settled from a roster standpoint, right? They didn't really get their full offense back and healthy till the Wisconsin game. The Wisconsin game, when Van Dyke went down, I think kind of let them know they needed to throttle down. But even there, I think they were starting to just kind of hum up the engine and they just kind of left that thing in second gear. The first two games, I don't think we really saw a whole lot. They, they had flashes of it with, with Milrow running the ball on the edges in some of those early games, but just on one or two drives, and then they scaled it back. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think they left a lot of stuff in the bag. There was a lot more, and, and I mentioned this before when we were doing the preview, right? I, I've been impressed with how well they've coordinated Milrow as a runner into the other things they do functionally as an offense. Good play design means that every play has a counter and a counter to the counter and a run com- a run version and a pass version. And so you can give the same look with the same motion and you should have four to five different plays you could run out of that look and motion. Uh, and last year, I don't think Alabama had done that. And it's why it felt so disjointed at times in the second half of the season versus the first half and why it felt kind of weird when they got Milrow going. And it, I think, worked for a bit and then people adjusted and it didn't work because they didn't have all those counters built in. And once you had it all on tape, it was kind of settled. Here, to your point, Alabama had shown some of the base looks and base formations and base plays, and now they started to show, here's the counter from it. You know, here's that look, but now we give it on the sweep. Here's this look, but now we run a quarterback counter off it. Here's this look, but now we throw deep off it. It, You know, tons of plays, especially in the first half. It was kind of amazing to me how much they used the tight end, right? They they had all these these plays where they're going side to side and, and showing a lot of eye candy, and then I don't know how many passes they threw to the tight end, just you know, right off the edge, basically give the linebacker a bunch of stuff to look at, and then say, oh no, we're just going to take that tight end for 11 yards. Right. And they did that over and over again to, to tremendous effect, and I think that says a lot about how well integrated that offense is, and probably how much of it hadn't been shown on the tape because it really had Georgia on their heels. Clearly, they had seven completions to tight ends plus. Robbie Oots and I think they had three incompletions. Um, one of them was a was an interception. That was actually a good read. Um, for me, I, I've seen a lot in this game that I haven't seen from Jalen Milrow in the past, and I think that it is an indicator that he didn't have the offensive coaching staff. You know, he said Bill O'Brien. I think in the past told him he wasn't set up to be a quarterback, and then last year. Um, we saw that offense because Jalen Milrow in the intermediate game one, there were a lot of throws there that were easy if he made the right read and he did. And a couple of those were tight end throws. Um, we hadn't seen that. Like I, I even tweeted, I think during the South Florida game, this Alabama offense feels like everything is hard. Everything is just, 
it's just a grind. And I think it's because they there's a whole part of their offense that generates these easy throws, and they're not easy if you don't make the right read. Um, that he didn't, that they weren't even utilizing. So they were playing with one arm behind their back. The other thing I noticed from Jalen Milrow that Jalen Hurts never figured out while I was at Alabama was Milrow has started to replace the blitzer with the hot read. And that has not been the case in the past. A lot of times he's had a blitzer come in and that's what led to a lot of those sacks last year. And he didn't immediately put the ball where the blitzer came from. And I, he did that probably four or five times in this game and it was deadly. Um, so I, I do think there was a lot there, but I also want you to touch on a little bit the defense, especially in the first half. There's some reasons why I think the defense faded down the stretch, but in the first half they were dominant, and they showed a lot of blitz looks that they haven't shown all year. I, I was listening to several people talk about the Alabama defense so far under Womack in that they just don't blitz, and that was definitely not the case against Georgia. So it kind of felt like they were holding back defensively too. I think so. They they've been on record going into this game that Alabama had not shown all the all the tricks they had in the book defensively, and you know there are a lot of things you can do these days with defenses and split field coverage from a blitz perspective that's really really hard to deal with. Um, crash course in 15 seconds for people that aren't familiar. Uh, the way that defenses have gone, Alabama has totally adopted this. Georgia, you know, moving to more of a zone based scheme has adopted it is you are more zone heavy and you're zone heavy in part because you can run something called split field, meaning one half of, they, for example, cover six. What, co- what does cover six mean? It means it's a combination of cover four and cover two. Everybody knows cover two, you get two safeties deep. Cover four, you got four safeties deep. Well, there's s- specific scenes when you have cover two, right? Like you've got a guy here, a guy here, seam, 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 you know, across the way. If you switch that up and then you run cover six, well, now... On this side of the field, there's two guys. This side of the field, there's one. So the seams, there's kind of a seam here, and there's kind of a seam here. But on the other side, if you try to hit that seam route on the right-hand side, you end up throwing straight to a safety because he's aligned basically where the seams are supposed to be. If you think of it this way, right? Like the two guys on one side are aligned in the seams for the other on either side when you mirror it. And it's a trap for quarterbacks. It's been killing the NFL. Alabama runs a lot of that. It's very complicated. People talked about it a number of times in the broadcast. Saban's scheme is very complicated post-snap. There's a lot of communication. It's probably the single most complicated scheme. But what they're running now is still extremely complicated because the, the zone like coverage matchups are a lot on both sides of the field. And the thing that you saw early on from Beck was he was seeing ghosts because you snap the ball and you turn to throw and you say, okay, first progression, second progression, third progression. You look look over cover two okay you know my first read on on this right here this guy's running a running a seam route it's cover two that seam runs right to the right to the safety okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to the right I'm gonna look for the the deep middle post why is there a safety there oh crap this is cover six so I'm expecting there to be a seam in the middle of the field there's not all right now I got him in a third and then you get then you get pressure right this First, second, third, you read the defense, you flow through idea. I don't think people understand what these split field coverages. You can't just read coverage at the snap anymore. And there's a lot of times, I know there was one big snap, Daniel, we we were watching, and I, I, re, I think I remember texting you about this. And it's like, oh, this looked like cover three, and this guy getting, didn't get deep enough. And it's like, wait a second. And I, I actually rewound and watched it. I was like, no, that was cover six. Because both times you have three three deep, but it's the alignment's different. And... It really is hard on a quarterback because if you're a pre-processor, high-functioning quarterback and you're used to making reads and throwing, you can't trust anything that you see pre-snap because they disguise it all. And then post-snap, you have to kind of double process. And it's just hard to deal with. And it's especially hard when I don't think Georgia had seen all of it on tape. So back in that first quarter and a half is kind of processing what he's seeing, trying to figure out what even is this coverage I'm looking at? I thought it was cover three, but they're not quite aligned correctly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think Alabama had a lot of stuff they held back. I think it gave Georgia fits. And then late in the game, I do think that started to turn around a little bit because Georgia got more comfortable saying like, hey, you know, we can get this guy isolated one-on-one and they got past the defense and stuff like that started happening and it worked out better. But early, um, you could tell Alabama held a lot of things back and it, it gave Georgia a lot of issues. Yeah, I, and I think that... 
By the way, I was promised a 15 second uh, crash course. I do not think I got that. Well, it was 15 <laughs> seconds on on cover. <laughs> there were like two. And there then, were 15 seconds there. You're right. <laughs> yeah, and then it was. I just. I had the rest of it was was you know sort of an enlightening people once we built the foundation <laughs> for my rant. Um, you know, at one point this was just a dominant performance from Alabama, and then you just knew. Like, even Kirby at the half didn't seem rattled. You knew that they were going to make adjustments. I was really impressed, offensively and defensively, the in-game adjustments that Georgia made, and I, I expected nothing less. Like, I, I do think, like I said this, I tweeted this at the time, that game could have been a lot worse at the end of the first half. Uh, you had a pretty bad missed pass interference um, that uh, could have been called for Georgia. The interception that Milrow threw was the correct read to an open tight end, he barely threw it behind him, got tipped into a interception. Um, there were just a couple of things that if they break a different way, it's, it's blowout city, and it's not set up contextually to where Georgia could run anything that resembled their normal offense they did for the entire third quarter. But having said all that, Georgia deserves a ton of credit here for the adjustments they've made and just – you know, putting aside any technical discussion, coming out of this game where you ultimately took the lead, losing 41-34, going forward, that's a whole different mindset for your team than if you lost this game 41-13. to Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things for Georgia that you can take away that are positive for sure. Uh, they came back, they took the lead in this game late, they fought hard, I think, you know, it's interesting, and we can we can talk on some advanced stats on this later, Daniel, and who, who was the better team coming out of it, regardless of outcome. But if nothing else for Georgia, I think they found some things out about their team. One, you know, we talked about how Carson Beck hadn't played in a hostile crowd before, thinking it was going to keep it a low-scoring game. Well, it looked like it was going to be low-scoring for Georgia early, but I think they exercised some of those demons. I, I don't think Beck is going to be rattled as much on the road again. He was rattled at Kentucky. He was rattled early against Alabama. He shook it off. He's done that in a lot of games now. Clemson, too, he was kind of rattled early. But I think this is probably going to be a big confidence boost for him. I also think they figured some stuff out at receiver, Daniel. I mean, we came into this game saying Lovett was their number one receiver. Uh, the leader in yardage was Arian Smith. The second guy was Dylan Bell, who was almost, I think, probably outplayed Smith in a lot of ways. It's just Smith was more the deep threat. Um, Smith has not been a complete receiver through his career. There was a couple drops in this game that really hurt him. And I, I think we're still s sort of seeing that from Smith. I know there's one big miscommunication in that game, Daniel. One of the I INTs, we tweeted it at the time. It was clear to me that it was probably on Smith that had failed to, I, I said, you know, maybe missed a hot route. I think the word you'd heard was it was a failed check. Uh, part of that is due to crowd noise, but they try to communicate that they're going to run a tunnel screen and that was the the interception, sort of in their own uh, in their own territory, that sort of I think put Alabama up, if I remember right, maybe to thirty three. I don't know. It, it was one of the big points to let Alabama have a little bit more breathing room. Um, but that was just you know failed play route, right? It wasn't a bad throw from back. It was you know Smith probably didn't get the check, probably because he couldn't hear, but also at some level probably he's not looking or looking for the reads or whatnot that he's supposed to. Those things have a big impact those things are finally getting ironed out and they've got the talent there to be successful. And late in the game, they kind of put all that together and they became extremely successful. Um, you know, Beck was struggling with his reads, which I think he, he wants to operate in this understanding of the offense. And at a certain point, it's like they realized, Hey man, just chuck it, trust yourself, trust your arm. And it didn't really matter if the Alabama was in cover three or cover six or that whole discussion, the place that Georgia got into in the game is if I got a guy streaking downfield, right? Any any real multiple deep zone coverage, be it cover three, cover four, whatever, when you run four verts, it essentially turns in a man. Meaning if every, if everybody's running a vertical, and you got four guys, you got three guys, you got two guys, those guys in zone have to pick up one of the guys streaking downfield, and they become man coverage functionally, unless it's it's mixed man zone. But anytime you have cover three or more. It's always zone underneath, so it ends up being man coverage downfield, effectively. And so they just started doing that. They, they ran a lot of vertical routes. 
That meant that the outside corner, who was usually they were t- attacking the freshman, Damani Jackson was the guy on one side, and they had a freshman on the other, who were uh, multiple freshmen. It was Mbakwe and then Brown, who had the interception at the end of the game. And, you know, they they take Dylan Bell on this big touchdown, and they just run him up the field, turns into man coverage, throw him the ball. And they were running by those Alabama DBs who weren't bailing fast enough. And I think both teams learn a little bit from that, right? Like Georgia learned how to trust the receivers, learned how to throw deep, be more confident in that when those are your matchups, take the one-on-one. Alabama had a lot of really young DBs. We talked about that being a weakness for them in the preseason. And Alabama learned... At the very end of the game, when they got an interception, when you're in cover three, you best not let the guy run by you. But if you don't let him run by you and you throw it up, you're going to have eyes on the quarterback. And so I think both these teams got a lot better over the course of the night. And I think Georgia showed a lot of positive things, a lot of positive things as they progressed. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we've talked about how Georgia has one of these clunker games every year, and Kentucky was that game for them. I think I think there's more good that came out of this game than bad for Georgia in that, especially the comeback uh, on the road, it shows that there are an elite, among the elite teams. If everybody thinks Alabama is the number one team in the country, then you can't dump Georgia. You just can't. Um, and right now I would probably take them on a neutral field against Texas, I think, um, depending on who all is healthy, but that's that's part of it. I want to talk a little bit um, and then give you a chance to talk about advanced stats. I want to talk a little bit about something that, might upset Georgia fans, trigger warning, um, but just keeping it real about what I saw. And it's this notion of how some of what enabled Georgia to come back in this game was playing it under artificial conditions. And what I mean by that is you don't go for it on fourth down on your own 29-yard line in I think the first half or early in the second half if you're not getting ear hold, you know, you don't take some of the risks you take if you're not getting just killed and you have, you can't, it's at some point it becomes a possession game and you have to score every possession or you lose. And so when you go, I think it was six for six on fourth down, you miss one of those. And by the way, one of them was stopped, but Alabama had a timeout, a couple of them they made by half a yard. And look, I'm not discrediting that. I'm just saying, if you look at the odds of any team, like if you look at the odds of Ohio State doing that against Marshall, going six for six on fourth down, it's probably not going to happen. Um, the very first long drive, where I think they went for it two or three times in the second half, really got into Alabama's depth and really impacted their pass rush in a way that they just were ineffective the rest of the game. And we talked about this in the preview that Alabama's secondary letting people buy them isn't that big of a liability because they're so disruptive with their pass rush that it neutralizes your ability to make a good throw there. I think a lot of things happened for Georgia. Also, I think Beck played a little bit out of his mind because what you assume that, that you've lost it takes a lot of that pressure off, and you can just kind of go out there and play. Really, the fourth downs, but just in general, how that game went was a lot of they're playing in a way that they wouldn't play if the game was 13 to 10 or 20 to 21. And so, from that standpoint, I do think that it artificially made Bama look a little bit worse than they actually are. I actually think their defense is a lot better than they showed in the second half. And I don't know, like if these two teams play tomorrow, I would pick Alabama because coming out of this, having seen all of that, I see one team who dominated when the game was 0-0. I see another team who was dominant when they had nothing to lose and were playing it artificially going forward on fourth down on the 29-yard line and getting some of those. To me, coming out of this, Alabama was the better team. There's so many factors when you start talking about this, especially in a game where both teams had a lead. Alabama had a huge lead. Georgia had a huge run. Uh, the first is is injuries. I know we were talking about Daniel. When I was watching in the third quarter, seeing what stalled Alabama, you know, the, the first drive was sort of miscues. Georgia mixing up coverage. Alabama running mesh man beaters when Georgia was in zone, bit them a couple times. And then there was one play in particular when they got near the near the goal line, and that was the point where they were going, where Alabama ended up going from thirty to thirty three. Why did they get stopped? Um, they ran this like edge play with Milrow, 
and the edge player played inside, so Milrow kept and ran right. And then that edge guy came off the inside and actually managed to run Milrow all the way to the boundary to his help. And I'm like, man, that dude flashed. It's like, that, that's got to be Mikel Williams because I knew he hadn't been healthy enough to play. And sure enough, I rewound the tape and it's 13. It's, it's Williams. He only played a handful of snaps on and off through the whole game. But when he was in there, man, it's just an immediate impact, even not healthy. He's that good. And, and that kind of thing showed up. And Qua Russaw barely played for Alabama. He still recorded one of their three sacks. So a, a lot of factors come in when you have a game that's that long and so many things have to happen. Um, but I think, too, to your point, it was a really weird game when you have nothing to lose. Um, and, yeah, Alabama got in their depth. Alabama did get worn down. You know, the Russell point is sort of to to establish that there's a drop-off with him, Mikel Williams, whoever. There's a drop-off from these teams. I know they have a tremendous amount of depth from their starters and on. And when they got to their second or third string guys having to play in there, and Alabama to, a, I think, a crazy degree, I don't know how many top teams I've ever seen do this, rotates a corner. They probably played six or seven corners, Daniel, in that game. I, I don't... They, we talked about it the first couple games because I'd noticed it and how weird it was. I did. I thought that was an experimentation training thing. I didn't really expect them to keep doing it. Um, I guess it helps from an exhaustion standpoint, but there's certainly a lot that Alabama gives up when they don't have their starters out there. When Devonta Smith got hurt for Alabama, when they were down in their depth, when they didn't have the starting D-line, they stopped getting a pass rush. And for most of the game, you could basically say the team that's winning the game right now is the team that's blocking. Um, you know, the point where Alabama blocked six with five at one point where Proctor had, I think it was Chambliss and the DN at the same time. Um, yeah, that has a big effect. I mean, it was a Walker or Chambliss, one of them on the edge, and he had the DN. And, and they had a big path play because they blocked six with five, and that gives, gives you numbers downfield. And then all of a sudden, late in the game, they, they stopped being able to handle Georgia's pressures. They mixed things up more. Uh, exact opposite that Georgia had. But, you know, Daniel, I will turn this around and talk a little bit about the numbers in that regard, right? So it, Alabama outgained Georgia 547 to 5, 519. Doesn't sound that different. Georgia had more first downs, 25 to 21. That's all just boring boring math. What I think is more interesting is when you look at conversions and you look at some of the advanced stats. So uh, both teams converted three third downs in the game. Interestingly, Georgia faced 15, Alabama faced 11. But fourth downs, Georgia was 5 of 5. But that number doesn't include, I think, two more that were converted by a penalty. Ultimately, Georgia ended up running 80 plays. 76 went down on the stat sheet. I think there were four more that were run and then called back for penalty. Alabama ran about 65. That 15-play you know, differential really showed up, I think. <clears throat> but when you talk about that number of conversions and the success rate that Georgia had, you know, the, you know, we have the advantage now of actually looking at advanced box scores, which we don't do a ton. It's kind of why these games are kind of fun to process sometimes for all for us. Success rate for Georgia in this game was 43%. Success rate for Alabama is 47, meaning neither team in a given play was more likely than not to be successful. Most plays were unsuccessful for both teams by a slight margin for the entirety of the game. Georgia, won't shock you, was most successful in the second and fourth quarter. They were over 50% successful in those two. They were only 27, 26% successful in the first and third quarters. If you have a team that is 43% successful, the odds of them converting five out of five or seven out of seven fourth down conversions is pretty darn low, right? It's a coin flip every time you do the play, less than a coin flip, and you did it five times in a row. I don't know, what's the math on that? Two, four, eight, 16, 32. One out of 32, roughly. We're gonna throw the penalties out of that. So it's very, very rare. And, and so when you consider, again, you know, if you're 43% successful, you're 40% successful, right, on, on a given play, and you have to be successful to convert, you, you got like a about a 3% chance, 6% chance of those conversions happening. <coughs> Win expectancy for Alabama, 93%. It tracks. The odds of Georgia converting that many plays in a row, somewhere around 5 to 5%, 3%. Add the, the penalty yardage, which is a guaranteed conversion, yeah, it bumps you up to about 6 to 7%. And if they didn't do that, they weren't going to win the game. And that is exactly what the advanced box score tells you, that Alabama had a 93% chance to win. In other words, being minus 3 in the turnover margin, facing that many third downs with the success rate that Georgia has, 
it is very, very hard to stay in that game and actually take a lead with those kinds of statistics. Yeah, and and if you look at it outside of like probability, which I th- I think that you know the one thing that you always highlight that's really interesting is, you know, if you've got a five game stretch where you're better than all five of those teams, you still don't have a hundred percent chance of winning. It's actually pretty low that you're going to go undefeated. Um, you think about all of those fourth down conversions. Two of them, I think, were really good throws, like really good. Um, I think they were both slants. Um, one of them, ETN, was dead to rights in the backfield, made a great play uh, against a future NFL guy um, to, to eke out the first down. Like I said, a couple of them were penalties. Um, but there's a lot of things that could go wrong that do go wrong in college football that did not go wrong for Jordan. And look, to their credit, they executed. And that's why they're Georgia, because we're not talking about Alabama versus you know, Mississippi State in this scenario. So it's not shocking that they did this. It's just not probable that they would do this if they had to repeat it again. Having said all that, the 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 win expectancy is really interesting because those are generally pretty good. Um, and and though even though you say all of that, at the end of the day, it was just a really damn good football game. It was, and... Look, something I say a lot when you deal with a lot of advanced statistics, they're interesting in terms of talking about how good a team is and where their strengths and weaknesses are. Advanced stats tend to be the, as I put it, it's why you won the game or why you lost the game, not so much why you're going to win or lose the next one. So we'll say Alabama being a 93% chance to win does not mean Alabama is 93-7 to better than Georgia at all, clearly from the scoreboard. And those things, the little things that matter matter a lot. So, you know, that that number is taking into account that Alabama was, you know, again, plus three in the turnover margin. Alabama hit huge plays late when they needed to to win the game. All that stuff's in there. So it's considering it. Georgia staying in the game as well as they did, to your point, Daniel, has a lot to do with the way game flow works and executing well at the right time, right? You know, Beck, it's one thing to say Beck, you know, was in the game and they hit some screens and, or hit some slants and kept them going. Beck had to still complete those slants. You know, they still had to catch those slants. They still had to get separation. The fact that they had Dylan Bell running those slants on a five-star into Money Jackson and Beck hits him in stride, that is something Georgia accomplished and when they needed to accomplish it in order to win the football game. So I think, you know, we, you know, stats are what they are. We're nerds as we are. Um, but, you know, there is a, certainly a lot of human element. And Georgia, when they needed to step forward and try to win the game, they did. And for a moment, it looked like they were going to win the game. Um, and, you know, the only reason that they lost it is that Alabama turned around and tried that much harder to win themselves. And these were just great players making great plays in a great football game between two teams that I have, to think, the talent to probably play again at some point this year. I, You know, I personally would set the odds of greater than 50% that they're going to play again sometime. Um and yeah, it's just good football. And like we said, you know, Daniel, when we did this preview, I called this an NFL style game from an odds maker perspective. And what I meant by that is these were two teams that are talented enough and close enough in quality that like an NFL style game, you can replay this game 10 times. And what I said is you can get 10 wildly different results. This was a crazy high scoring affair with a big blow blowout first quarter, Georgia clawing back, Alabama winning late. It would not shock me if these two teams played again and it's 20 to 17. It would not shock me at all. It's just they're so talented and they're so good in so many different areas that depending on who is executing at the highest level and what the, you know, we talked about late, you know, why did Alabama struggle in the third quarter? I went back and watched that, Daniel, and a lot of it just had to do with Alabama running the wrong man or zone beater concepts and Georgia, you know, catching Alabama running a a man beater when they were in zone. I think you, we talked about pre-show, Daniel, you went back and looked at the trick plays. You know, the reason Alabama's trick plays didn't work is they were expecting man coverage. They threw it, and Georgia caught them in a three-deep zone, and so everybody was floating back there. If they got man, they probably would have scored. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you could play this a bunch of times, and you're going gonna to get a bunch of different results. Um, and that's what makes college football fun when you have a game like this. Yeah, and look, I think that, the, the kind of frustrating thing about this is these teams might play two more times. So it sort of does 
water down this result, but this one was just a fun, a fun game to watch. Uh, it, it's probably more fun to watch it if you're not a fan of either of these two teams, just because of the stress factor. You know, you, you mentioned that like Alabama came back and scored. I thought that if Alabama tackled, um, I think it was Bell that scored um, the the last touchdown for Georgia, but he caught it at like the twenty. And I'm like, man, if they got, I think Saab got his hands on on him, turned his hips, but he didn't get him down on the ground. I was like, man, if he gets him down on the ground right there, Alabama's in trouble because it was like two and a half minutes left in the game, and Georgia could have melted clock and left Alabama with like 50 seconds and no timeouts if they had gone on to score. And then Alabama scores in one play, and I'm like, oh, man, they gave them too much time, and they almost scored again. So um, just a wild game, and it shows you this is what I always say. I've always said it about Alabama, but I'll say it about Georgia. I'll say it about Ohio State. When you play a team that talented, that has a good coaching staff, games against them are just long. Texas-Alabama last year is a great example of this because Alabama had no business being in that game. Texas at that point in the year, I think it was week three, was so much a better team than Alabama, but Alabama was just so talented that games against them are long. You can't put them away, and Alabama couldn't put Georgia away because Georgia is Georgia. And so it's fun to watch. Um, Fans of both teams probably were feeling it a little bit, um, but for, for everybody else collectively in college football, it was a good weekend Unlike this weekend, that's pretty boring. Josh, give me one final note on this game before we close it out. Well, I think the the other unsung part of the game that I, I really want to harp on a little bit this week was just how good a job they did from the broadcast perspective with Herb Street. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about Ben Herb Street, not not Kirk. Kirk's okay; he's fine. He's a great broadcaster. But Ben, I think, was the highlight of that game, at least as far as my wife was concerned. So. I don't know if, if anybody else is out there that feels like they need to have like a Ben cam, like a command center with Ben in the corner at all times for your significant other. Uh, just feel free to shout it out in the comments because I feel like uh, I feel like, you know, it, there's nothing that makes college football as acceptable to wives and girlfriends. And I'll say, by the way, my wife is a huge football fan, huge football fan, loves watching the game anyway. But if you want to get her like full on pay attention you know, just put just put Ben in the corner of the screen the whole game, and you know she's there. She's there for all four quarters. So uh, that's the last thing I'm going to add. Completely random, but yeah, Ben control Ben command center football. It needs to happen. ESPN make it so. I'll offer another layer to that. If you're going to give Ben his own room with command center, maybe put the Affleck duck in there that they had on stage at game day. Just see what happens. Um, all right, y'all. Let us know what you think about this game. Um, if we are out of line in our kind of how we saw it play out, or if there's any other insights that we miss, would love to mix it up with y'all in the comments. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a wonderful week and God bless.